dietary effort. And that's the case in someone who's healthy. But in someone who's got chronic lung disease, for example, chronic bronchitis and emphysema, then <clears throat> they have got high levels of carbon dioxide all the time because they have difficulty breathing out. So they've got chronic high levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. And this means that the uh, part of the brain which responds to high levels of carbon dioxide is overwhelmed and does no longer respond to it. It's flooded, if you like, with carbon dioxide. So patients with uh, chronic airways conditions, chronic lung diseases, don't breathe because they, the amount of carbon dioxide builds up. They breathe because the amount of oxygen in the blood runs low. Can you see the difference? In health, you breathe because the amount of carbon dioxide builds up. In chronic obstructive airways diseases, chronic lung diseases, the patient breathes because of oxygen lack. It's kind of a backup system, if you like, a reserve system that kicks in only after long periods of time with uh, chronic airways disease. So they're breathing because of oxygen shortage. The CO2 level is always high. So if you give them a lot of extra oxygen, <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of extra oxygen in the blood. Therefore, they're no longer going to be stimulated to breathe by oxygen lack. Because there is no oxygen lack because you've put a lot of oxygen in. So what's going to stimulate them to breathe if there's lots of oxygen in the blood? Well, nothing is, and they can slow down or even stop breathing. So for this reason, it's an absolutely golden rule that unless someone who really knows what they're talking about, preferably a, a physician or an anaesthetist, says give this patient more oxygen than 24%. We don't give them more than 24%. Unless, of course, it's some other a very acute emergency when we can observe them, all, observe them all the time. So the rule of thumb is oxygen at 24% in chronic conditions and no higher unless there's a very good reason or someone who knows what they're talking about says to give them more. So that's the rule, 24%. I'm just going to put a few notes down. I'll let you read through these on your own, I think. So to conclude this talk on ox oxygen therapy, we're going to look at some uh, safety aspects of oxygen, giving oxygen. And then this introduction will be finished. So safety aspects. Well, thinking about the possibility of giving oxygen inappropriately, gain medical approval for oxygen therapy. But in the short term, in the absence of chronic obstructive airways disease or chronic chest conditions, you're not going to do a lot of harm by giving someone oxygen therapy. So, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you can give someone 50 or 60% oxygen uh, for 24 hours or more 
In fact, uh, you can probably give them 100% for 12 to 24 hours. 24 hours, really, with, with, no, problems, uh, with no problems. In fact, the, the only times you could give such high concentrations really would be if, if the patient was ventilated. So if the patient's breathing on their own, that then, okay, 50, 50 or 60% for 24 hours it, it is safe. If you do give high concentrations for longer term, there are changes in the lung, which are, are abnormal changes in the lung. But uh, it would have to be high concentrations for long periods of time. So normally it, it's fairly safe, unless the patient's got airways disease, certainly for a few hours. <clears throat> in the absence of chronic airways disease, high concentrations of oxygen are, are absolutely fine. So <clears throat> again, medical approval, just to be on the safe side, make sure we know exactly that the therapy is closely matched to the uh, patient's condition. Oxygen is odourless, colourless and aids combustion. Now a lot of people think that oxygen burns, it doesn't. A lot of people think that oxygen is explosive, it, it isn't. But what oxygen does is supply the fuel, well not the fuel, but you need fuel and oxygen for a fire. So what oxygen will do is it will massively aid the rate of any combustion, of any burning that is there. And it does become explosive if it's mixed with other gases, such as hydrogen, or any uh, anaesthetic agents or other solvents, then it might become explosive. So even low oxygen is, is itself not inflammable. I suppose it's reasonable to treat it as if it were an inflammable gas, because it can... Um, it can make other things burn more rigorously. So there should be no smoking, there should be no sparking electrical equipment near oxygen, and there should certainly be no other gases that are going to mix with it and potentially uh, form an explosive mixture. So oxygen aids combustion, that's the key thing to remember, and it does so very vigorously. So again, you should know what things you're using, and if they are inflammable, be very careful not to let them mix with oxygen, because when you've got the fuel, for example, the alcohol vapour, when you've got the material to oxidise it with, that is the oxygen, then it can be explosive in that, in that situation. Now oxygen cylinders should be uh, stored upright and uh, secured to the wall. Normally there's a ring or something that holds them up. And the main reason here is that they can roll away or drop on your foot and they're heavy and could easily break your foot. So uh, be careful with the cylinders. Normally we get the porters to change the cylinders and the flow meters but of course you should learn how to do it as well uh, because you may need to do it when there's no one around who's carrying the oxygen cylinders around for you. We should have no smoking in hospitals anyway but especially not around oxygen therapy. No naked flames because the flame will burn much more vigorously if there's oxygen in the area. Don't use electrical equipment near oxygen tents because there there's a lot of oxygen at the same place all at once. And if anything did start fire, the, the oxygen would fuel the fire very dramatically and uh, could result in quite a nasty situation. And finally, we should know how to deal with fires, sh sh should one uh, occur. So really, that concludes our introduction to oxygen therapy. But I'm going to say one more thing just before we finish. And that is, although it's not directly part of the nurse's role, we must ensure that patients that do need oxygen have continuity of supply. So, for example, one time in Southeast Asia, a case I heard about, someone was uh, halfway through an operation and the oxygen supply ran out and they got brain damage, very severe brain damage, and I think, in fact, died. And in fact, recently, a very tragic case in a hospital in South Africa where the hospital oxygen supply actually failed and patients that were dependent on oxygen during surgery and in intensive care in ventilator-type situations were all of a sudden deprived of it 
and, and many patients got brain damage, which is, is a major tragedy. So think